division because I wanted his help, but he did a terrific job over a summer. Uh, but he's otherwise also proved that the students were right and that Dean Griswold's skepticism was, as usual, exaggerated. Uh, I'm just going to run through uh, the, the remarkable number of things that this law student, of all things, has been able to do and do well. Uh, it's really a stunning list, and I'm not going to talk about any of them. I'm simply going to read you a list and get, give you a sense of why we wanted Bob Zellick here. This is the example uh, that Griswold doubted was there and was there. Um, okay. Uh, let me see if I can get in the right order. Um, he went to the, he, I'm just going to start in the Department of, of the Treasury. When Bob was, uh, let me see, I, I, I had just looked. Counselor. Uh, how old were you then? Oh, I don't know, 30s. <laughs> quick, quick, quick. He in his 30s. He became a uh, counselor to, in the 80s, 1980s, to the Treasury Secretary, Jim Baker, and he became uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions. I mean, this is, this is just the very first touch of it. Uh, during George H.W. Bush's presidency, Zellick served with Baker as Under Secretary of State for Economic and Agricultural Affairs. So he's moved from law over to economic affairs in the Department of State. But he was also counselor to the department. Zellick served as Bush's personal representative for the G7 Economic Summit in 1991 and 1992. He's moved from law to diplomacy to uh, foreign economic affairs. He led the U.S. delegation to the talks on German reunification. He's going to tell you about, he's going to talk about three of these and what he knew and what he learned and what he did. But nothing is bigger or harder than German reunification. There was, it was a time shortly after 17 million Russians had been killed in the war, in the Second World War. And the question was whether with the Berlin Wall down, there should be or could be a single Germany. Persuading the Russians of that was Bob's job. Um, he had then became general counsel of Fannie Mae. He worked at it, he did a number of academic things in, in the meantime, including heading the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Now he's deep into foreign affairs in the late 90s. Um, in the, he, he was asked by Baker to take an important part in the 36-day battle over whether uh, Gore or Bush had won the presidency in 2000. 2001, he became trade representative in Bush's first term. Uh, a job where he has to know domestic politics and he has to bring them to bear in an intelligent way in developing inter a, a form of international relations that has become more and more important. He became Deputy Secretary of State in 2005-2006 and had a lot to do with China policy. He, uh, what in the world do you know about China? Uh, he took part in the Darfur peace process. Uh, what in the world do you know about southern Sudan? I, I think he got it all from that one summer with me. Uh, he then became president of the World Bank in 2007 for five years. And... Uh, uh, he's going to talk to you about that, too, 
So he's going to talk to us about what it, what it is, and you're supposed to be looking at him and asking, how does a, a, somebody with a law school education, he also went to the Kennedy School, come out and deal with German reunification, world trade, and U.S. role in it, and he then, I think I've left out, became president of the World Bank. Um, now, he asked me not to take much longer than this in telling where he's been. There's, lot, there's lots more. And he certainly proved to Dean Griswold that the students were right. A well-trained Harvard Law School student with the right attitudes of having to learn and being willing to do can do anything. <coughs> Mr. Zellick. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have this odd feeling I've attended my memorial ceremony. <laughs> um, my feelings coming into this room were a little different. I think the last time I was here, I can see from some of you in the audience, you'll recognize this reference. Uh, I was given a blue book, uh, and I had to fill in the blue book before I was able to leave law school. Uh, this room has particularly anxious memories for me because it's where I took my civil procedure exam in my first year. And I learned something that was very important for future negotiations. Don't have a second cup of coffee in the morning, <clears throat> <laughs> particularly in a building where the washrooms are downstairs. Um, so uh, of course, Harvard Law School trains lawyers. Uh, but as Phil mentioned, uh, some of us lose our way. Uh, so I very much appreciate the invitation to be included with so many people who have made their mark in the legal profession. Uh, it's a particular privilege to be here uh, with Phil because when I was a joint law student and student at the Kennedy School, uh, Phil was our model. Uh, Phil, of course, served as Deputy Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division where I learned a great deal from him uh, over a brief period. Uh, Solicitor General's office. What is uh, this, memorial service? <laughs> what is <it> special <laughs> about here? But, uh, and State Department and others. But I'll, uh, I'll highlight one thing that Phil used always with a good sense of wit and sense of humor that stuck with me and that uh, I drew on uh, in subsequent points, which is sometimes after we were having a long discussion about kind of uh, legal dimensions, political, uh, sort of bureaucratic, all the issues that go into government and policy, he'd pull back and he'd say, so what's the right thing to do? <clears throat> and it changed the whole tone uh, of a discussion because it's easy in any job to kind of get caught up in the details and it's useful to step back and think what's the really important thing. And I relay that because I actually said that a number of times with colleagues at different jobs, and it always totally changed the conversation. And I have to say, it made people feel much better about the work of public service to recognize they were really there to try to figure out what's the right thing to do. So this morning, I'm going to try to share uh, relatively quickly uh, three experiences, and Phil and I will give opportunity for all of you to ask some questions. One, he mentioned working on German unification in 89 and 90. Uh, second, uh, US trade representative, where I was from 2001 and 2005, and third, president of the World Bank. Now, some of you uh, may recall from law school the challenge of issue identification. So my stories are going to be a slightly different test. They're a test of legal skills identification in different contexts. So as I reflected on the difference that law school made to me, I thought of the schools, the, uh, the skills that you can learn in a law school environment at least, negotiation, uh, mediation, certainly uh, advocacy, uh, draftsmanship, and I'll work in a little one about even the importance of good proofreading. Um, but there's another dimension, uh, and I see people like Stu Eisenstadt here who had this shared experience, that I think uh, one of the important aspects of my policy career was thinking about processes, institutions, rule of law, and how these could help shape the international system. It's not a sovereign state as you learn in sort of federal courts, but it's an offshoot of the types of principles that people started to develop in the United States in 1787, 1789. 
And I think that's particularly important because I think some of those issues are on the table today. So first, German unification. Uh, as Phil mentioned, the division of Berlin and Germany was the defining event after World War II. Indeed, the so-called German question uh, dominated European politics since the unification of Germany in 1871. Two wars to prove it. Because of that, when German unification uh, started to appear as an issue, uh, Margaret Thatcher reminded us that she liked Germany so much that she preferred two of them. Um, so on November 9th, 1989, uh, the East Germans opened the Berlin Wall. And I might add, accidentally. Uh, as the historians who have been able to demonstrate, none of this was, was planned. By September 12th, 1990, 10 months later, the victorious four powers of World War II had agreed on a peaceful, democratic unification of Germany uh, in NATO, and Germany was unified by October 3rd. So how did this happen so quickly? So seven quick points. First, uh, it may seem obvious, and I'm sure a lot of you have encountered this in your careers, but uh, the challenges of inbox and daily meetings and other demands uh, sometimes press out the most critical challenge, which is to try to anticipate. Uh, people who study intelligence realize it's very hard to predict, but I do believe you can anticipate directions and trends. So in early 1989, uh, the ice of the Cold War uh, was breaking. Uh, Gorbachev was a celebrity figure, um, and the question was, was he going to try to revive Soviet strength, or was he really looking for fundamental change? Or was he looking for both? So in the spring of 89, uh, President Bush 41 made a very bold proposal that's now been lost except to historians. He moved the agenda away from the nuclear talks that had dominated the Reagan era to conventional forces in Europe. And he proposed a huge reduction in both sides, uh, but also uh, to equal levels. And this had an interesting effect because the true story of the Cold War was armies on the ground. It was a division of Europe with military forces. And what Bush's proposal did was a number of things. Number one, it highlighted uh, the issue of could Soviet forces go home, which would make a big political difference in Central and Eastern Europe. It removed the need for the nuclear uh, uh, sort of deterrent that the United States had had uh, to offset the three to one conventional force advantage. It allowed Gorbachev to think about reducing uh, costs, which he wanted. It embraced Germany because Germany, for, this, for Germans, this was a key issue. And this was a key strategic thought because what President Bush, Secretary Baker recognized, Germany would be the Schwerpunkt, the core point of future of Europe, as you've seen today. And we wanted to embrace Germany uh, in the process. It also established Bush's leadership of NATO because some of the other people, including Thatcher, weren't so keen uh, on these ideas. President, also, President Bush also visited Poland and Hungary to emphasize reform. One of the little understood things about Bush uh, was he's an extraordinary gentleman. He's also very competitive if you look at his background. Um, and he was competing with Gorbachev. He was trying to emphasize that on the world stage that he could uh, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a figure that had had world media uh, on his side. Second, um, with all this change, we needed a strategic framework. We needed some sense of where we wanted to go. It was important to stay flexible. But if you don't have a sense of where you're going to go, you're certainly not going to end up there. Now, the first order objective was a peaceful democratic unification of Germany. This may seem obvious, but there were very few in Europe that supported this. The United States and the American public, I might say, proudly stood for the fact that we, we had supported German unification for 40 years and our word was good. But we also had to address uh, the likelihood that Germany would likely become the dominant power in Europe. And this made people very anxious. So we combined support for German unification with the idea that it had to be done in NATO. And this was to reassure Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and even to a degree, the Soviet Union. We also suggested in, that the European communities, now the European Union, have deeper integration and that the United States strengthen ties with it as another basis for a European Germany as opposed to a German Europe. And we also proposed that the Helsinki process, the CSCE, today the OSCE, 
would create a framework for all the countries, all the way from the Soviet Union to Central and Eastern Europe to the United States and Canada as a framework. <clears throat> now, my boss, Secretary Baker, actually set this out in a speech in December 89. So this is within a month of uh, the end of the wall falling. And in a sense, what he was trying to do was say, we're going to close out the Cold War, but we're going to create a foundation for the future. So uh, third point, that framework defines the high-level strategy. But in any endeavor, you have to be closely aware of events on the ground. The German people were voting with their feet. And this raised the risks of accidents. We had German secret police, the Stasi. You had 380,000 Soviet troops still in East Germany. You know, what all of a sudden if all the, there was some killing or somebody was trying to sell their weapons and something broke out? What happens if the German people feel at this key moment they're being uh, thwarted? But there was also an advantage to this. We recognized that we could use the interest of the German people to create a diplomatic momentum. If people stalled, whether Britain or France or the Soviet Union, we could point to events on the ground and say, we have to act on these things. But it also meant the United States had to get ahead of the game. We had a very fine line to walk. We had principles <clears throat> like uh, Germany and NATO that were critical, but we didn't want to look like we were standing on the other side of the German people. So a lot of our diplomacy, public and private, uh, related uh, to this need to be arm in arm with Germany. And here let me give you a personal insight. And it's an example of how, certainly in diplomacy, but in all endeavors, it's important to try to keep your information sources uh, at the most basic level. Uh, and the same December visit that Baker made where he gave this speech, we went to Potsdam, city in East Germany next to Berlin. And we were meeting some figures of the government, so we wanted to offset it with meetings with some of the Lutheran ministers who had been courageous over the course of past years in offering a place of dissent. And we visited them, I remember, in a very dark, dank church. Um, and they were telling us about their plans for a third way, Judith Weg. They wanted to create an East Germany that would be different than the West or Soviet Union. And I remember asking them, so what about your parishioners? What do they think? And they said, they want what they see on West German TV. That was a very telling moment, because our embassy in East Berlin had been reporting the context from the intellectuals and thinking that this was the core movement. But in fact, what these courageous ministers were telling us was they had dreams, but the people on the ground were going to go in another direction. German unification was not going to be a merger. It was going to be a takeover. And this actually had legal implications, because the German basic law of the Constitution had an article called 23 that was designed to bring in Tsarland, which had been split off in the early period. But it also had one designed to have a full negotiation for a merger. And we and the Germans agreed we're going to use Article 23. This is going to be a takeover, not a merger. Fourth, an important point that lawyers learn, this policy is all nice, but what's the process? How do you make all this stuff happen? So we had the two Germanys, but what about the four power rights? We had the four powers, but the Germanys weren't going to be ignored. Should this be the 16 countries of NATO? Well, that leaves out the Soviets and the Eastern Europeans. Should it be the 35 countries of the CACE? Too unwieldy to get something done. So as all of you know, at Harvard Law School, you can get by with basic math skills. So we came up with the idea of two plus four. But it's very important. We didn't call it six. We emphasized two plus four because we wanted to emphasize this point that the Germanys were in the lead in the process, but the four powers would play a critical decision. This was the one sensitive issue between the State Department and the NSC, which otherwise worked extremely well hand in glove uh, during this period. I was at the State Department. Uh, but the, my colleagues at the NSC were worried that process could create paralysis. Would the Soviets use this to inhibit the process that we wanted to move forward. It was our argument that the Soviets had other points of leverage, 380,000 troops, four power rights, and we believe we could use the process to bring them along. And that takes me to the fifth point. How do you operationalize this? So this is the challenge of operations and or advocacy and explanation. The Soviets were off balance, as were many people throughout Europe. And one of the things we discovered is sometimes when your counterpart is off balance, you might have to help them come up with explanations if you want them to do with something. And so 
the Soviets didn't like this idea, but they could see the momentum. They didn't want to uh, thwart it, which would block Gorbachev's relations with Europe. So at one point, I remember discussing with my colleague and friend Dennis Ross, you know, we, we've offered many ideas, but I'm not sure the Soviets have recognized them. So I came up with the rather basic notion of packaging them. I made a count, and I came up with nine points that we had suggested, and I said, let's try to use these as a presentation. And Baker used it with Shevardnadze, the Soviet foreign minister. I used it the same day with the deputy foreign minister. And if you go back and you look at the Soviet archives, you'll see that this becomes quite important. It's the first time they recognize that the United States is leading an effort to try to deal with the Soviet issues. Now, what's intriguing was those points were out there. It was a question of how you use them and explain them and emphasize them. One more example, although there's many others. And this one has another little interesting legal dimension. Uh, Gorbachev was coming to visit President Bush in Washington at the end of May. We still hadn't cracked the issue of whether the Soviet Union would permit Germany to be unified in NATO. So I recall that that CSCE, which Gorbachev had enhanced, the, the coming out, this comes out of the 1976, the Helsinki Act, had a principle that said every country should be free to join their own alliance. So I suggested to my colleagues at the NSC that we have President Bush ask Gorbachev, could you agree that Germany will abide by the CSE principle and that it will be free to choose its own alliance. We will prefer NATO, but it's up to the Germans. Bush presents this, and Gorbachev agrees. And I don't think I've ever been in a meeting like that. You could physically see his Soviet counterparts separate themselves. They started to talk to themselves. Gorbachev realized, ooh, I might have gone too far, and he said, well, maybe the foreign minister should work this out, and Shevardnadze says, no, I think this is an issue for the presidents. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, we actually followed up, put some things in departure statements to try to nail it down, called the Germans. But that was the moment that Gorbachev relied on the CSE principle to allow a unified Germany and NATO. So uh, sixth point, as you can see from this story, personal relations do matter. Sometimes people talk about diplomacy, and I'm sure it's true of other negotiations, like it's just an analytical art. Not in my experience. Uh, Baker and Bush obviously had extremely close relationships with Chancellor Kohl of Germany and Genscher, uh, the foreign minister. And this was quite important because they were of different parties and sometimes rivals. And so we were sometimes from the U.S. side, the State Department, the NSC, trying to make sure that the German counterparts were lined up properly uh, on these uh, sensitive issues. Um, so uh, equally important were the relations with other allies. The only other European leader that supported German unification was Jacques Delors in the EC. So Bush did some very artful work with Thatcher and Mitterrand to sort of bring them along. There's actually a memorandum of conversation from uh, uh, the Mitterrand talking with um, Gorbachev early, trying to suggest maybe we should together block German unification. And Gorbachev's response was quite interesting. He thought he was being set up. He thought, well, if it's a choice of lining up with France and Britain or Germany and the U.S., I think I'll take the latter. The most critical relationship was obviously with the Soviets themselves. And here I'll show one story, but there are many I could tell that kind of give a sense of how different this was quickly with the end of the Cold War. As we were approaching the summer of 89, there was going to be a London summit of NATO. And we wanted to use that to signal to the Soviet Union that NATO was changing. So in advance, at one of the bilateral meetings Baker had with Shevardnadze, he actually says to Shevardnadze, here's the things we're going to try to get changed in NATO. And these were not small things. These were things like changing the nuclear doctrine or changing our approach to uh, Western, uh, the Eastern Europe. And Baker, who was the best negotiator I've ever met, was very careful to say, look, I'm trying to do these things, but I can't promise. I just want you to be aware of them. So a few weeks later, Baker, again, quite skillfully navigates these uh, through a NATO summit or the ministerial that drafted the declaration. And we announced them, and Shevardnadze embraces them. Now, Shevardnadze then told us, he said, this was extremely valuable because I knew what was coming, and I could be ready to say this shows NATO is making changes, where some of the hardliners in the Soviet Union had a very different approach. So just step back and think, you know, what... Uh, for a few years later and earlier from the Cold War, you've now got U.S. and Soviet foreign ministers 
talking in advance of changes the U.S. wants to do in NATO before NATO has done them so as to try to move the process forward. This is a point we won't talk about, but this is one reason why Baker and Shevardnadze together in Moscow could put out a statement against uh, Saddam Hussein's capture of Kuwait in the Gulf War in August 1990, something, by the way, that Gorbachev never approved, that, uh, that just Shevardnadze and Baker did uh, on their own with some uh, helpful staff work, I might add. Um, so <clears throat> the seventh point, and the last one, is critical in all these endeavors. Timing is critical. So it's May and June. The Soviets have agreed to uh, United Germany and NATO. In July, they meet with coal, or with, uh, with coal in Stavopol, which was the home region of Gorbachev. The Germans put some uh, economic incentives uh, on the line. By September, we've negotiated and signed the agreement. In October, Germany is unified. In December, Shevardnadze is forced to resign as foreign minister. By August of the next year, you have a coup uh, in the Soviet Union. So one of the issues during this period is we never knew when the window would close or whether something might happen on the ground that disrupted all this. So, and from the US side, as I alluded to, in August of 1990, you had the invasion of Iraq, or Iraq invading Kuwait, and all of a sudden the focus of U.S. attention from Bush and Baker has to very much shift to sort of building uh, an unprecedented uh, coalition. So the final story I'll give you on German unification uh, is a drafting story for all the good lawyers in the room. So when it came time to draft the final settlement agreement, we of course had to have the text precisely the same in the four official languages, uh, German, Russian, French, and English. So if those of you involved with diplomacy know, the British have some sense that English is their language. And the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the FCO, is the proudest protector of this principle. So when it came time to drafting, we said, OK, you do the most sensitive parts. And obviously, given the story of the German question, one of the most sensitive parts would be, how do we define this new United Germany? We want to make sure we get it right this time. So if you look at the text, basically it says, New United Germany should consist of the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, German Democratic Republic, East Germany, and Greater Berlin, which was the old four power unit. <clears throat> so you can imagine my surprise when my British colleague gave me the text and it said, New United Germany should consist of the Federal Republic of Germany, okay, German Democratic Republic, okay, and Greater Britain. <clears throat> so you hear a lot of talk about Brexit, just remember, these guys are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for German unification. All right. Um, I want to ask you for questions, but maybe I'll take the chair's prerogative of asking a couple first. Um, it sounds like, you know, uh, President Trump and the Secretary of State act as if uh, there, there's supposed to be nobody in the quarters of the Department of State these days. Uh, they make all the decisions, and they don't need a staff, and they don't need experts who have spent their life on Germany, and they don't need experts who have worried about uh, what, hap what Saddam Hussein is doing. They just do it. They just sort of travel. Uh, it probably saves money on planes. Uh, I get a little bit of a feeling of, you, you're giving us a wonderful description of uh, how you and three other people reunified Germany. Was, it, was there nobody from the Department of State there? Did anybody ask I thought I was in the Department of State. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was in the Department of State. Well, I, actually, I, 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 let me answer it fairly. Um, <clears throat> There's a separate question of uh, how, at least in my view, Trump's approach to foreign policy differs from that of other presidents across parties and the challenge it poses to the system. But, and that relates to this because it has an effect to any institutional body, whether it's the State Department, whether it's the intelligence agencies. The Defense Department tends to, with Mattis, get in a slightly different position. But to come back to the U.S. side, if you go back to the uh, accounts of that period, uh, there was sensitivity that Baker, as a very strong leader, would be dominating the State Department. Um, now, and Baker made a point 
that upset some people in the Foreign Service, which is he said, look, I'm the President's man at the State Department. I'm not the State Department's man at the White House. Now, what people could realize quickly at the State Department, but you could ask people like Nick Burns, who were a young Foreign Service officer there, who was on the faculty of the Kennedy School, was powerful secretaries of state are good to have. Um, it allows you to engage in the process more. And in fact, what we did was that we had a core group that were around Baker, Dennis Ross, Bob Kimmett, Margaret Tutwiler, and myself, but we certainly recognized the need to reach out to others. So in the German unification uh, process, uh, we relied closely on Ray Seitz, who was the Assistant Secretary for Europe, his deputy Jim Dobbins, who'd served in Bonn. I built a team, as I was referring to you, that had a, one of the deputy legal advisors, uh, who is now the president of Texas A&M, uh, Mike Young. Um, I had people from the intelligence side. So I personally think, and, and I come back to the State Department in, uh, uh, in 2005 and six, and uh, just to share you a little story on that, uh, Condi Rice is now the Secretary of State. And uh, I uh, was brought over from USTR um, and when asked to become the deputy. Does everybody know what USTR is? U.S. Trade Representative. Okay. U.S. Trade Representative is a cabinet post that I'm asked mm -hmm. to be a deputy. So when I received the phone call, I was actually on a flight, and one of my assistants said, uh, Condi wants to talk with you about the deputy at state, and I thought she was asking my advice. Um, and uh, they said, no, I think that she wants you to take the job. And I said, oh, my God. I said, it's better um, to rule in hell than serve in heaven. No, rule in heaven than serve in, well, one of those two. Uh, but, uh, and the State Department sure as heck is in heaven. Uh, and, uh, but for reasons of, of uh, sort of obligation and duty, I made the switch. But one of the stories was when I sat down with the staff in the State Department to deal with some issue, it might have been Darfur, um, the State Department is a multiple matrix organization. As you know, it's got the regional bureaus, it's got functional, it's got intelligence, it's got everybody playing. Um, so you have people from many offices in on an issue. And I remember trying to uh, assess the current U.S. policy towards the issue, whatever it was. <laughs> and, and so people were giving me the policy line. And I said, this is sort of a Phil Hyman line, I said, but does it work? <laughs> and then they'd give me the same policy line again. And I'd say, look, guys, it's just us. I appreciate your loyalty to the administration's policy, but let's figure out whether it really works. If it doesn't, maybe we can do something about it. Maybe we can't. But let's just be honest and try to figure out what's actually sort of going on here. Um, and what it made me reflect on and is that, you see, uh, the State Department, and this is one of the things you encounter now, uh, are a loyal career service. They're trying to follow the directions that come from the president and the president's senior appointees. But if, if basically the policies, and this was true uh, in the Clinton administration and frankly under Secretary Powell, if the policies are driven primarily out of the White House, they're not used to exercising policy judgment. That's not what they've been asked to do. So in a way, to be fair to those people in 2005, since the period with Baker, they hadn't really been asked to do what I was asking them to do. So the system works best, I think, if you've got political appointees that have some standing, ability to work with the president, I might add, Congress and other bodies as well, but then also know how to work their institutions to the fullest effect. All right, let me turn to the floor. Any questions? Yes, sir. Well, that was a marvelous tour de I think, Bill, could you enter? Maybe it'd be good if you start the process of introducing when you say who you are. So be, just if tell you, them you're Bill Riley. Whoever speaks. <laughs> There's a new biography of Gorbachev out. Um, I'm only up to 1964. 
so I can't tell you at least what his most recent biographer says. Um, the United States uh, did not put money on the table. Uh, Germany did, and I forget the exact sums, and part of it was related to those 380,000 troops. It was money that would be used to, to house them and bring them back uh, to the Soviet Union. What also gets referenced is, uh, and this was some of Baker's skill, was that uh, when Gorbachev was at a later point and struggling as we were trying to maintain the coalition for the first Gulf War, Baker arranged some money from the Saudi Arabians. Uh, so uh, there was some money that came, but it wasn't ours. Now, this is, a, this is an issue that historians debate, you know, whether the United States should have done a, a Marshall Plan for the Soviet Union. Uh, and by the way, this is interesting, since we're at Harvard, this is the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan's uh, announcement by George Marshall uh, in 1947. And there's a very good book coming out on the Marshall Plan, by the way, by Ben Steele uh, early next year. And it, my own belief is people use Marshall Plan analogies rather loosely. Uh, what would work in Western Europe in 47 and 48 would not have worked in the Soviet uh, economy of 1990 and 91. But there were also political constraints, uh, as you recall. Uh, Bush was uh, obviously uh, harshly criticized for working out a budget deal, which he did right before the first Gulf War that increased revenues. In fact, it may be one of the reasons he lost the election. And so he didn't really feel that he was in the position to finance the future uh, of the Soviet Union uh, or Russia. But we were certainly comfortable with the Germans uh, sort of contributing. Yes, sir. Could people hear the question? So the, the, the question uh, is whether it was uh, the right thing to do to enlarge NATO to Eastern Europe, given uh, the possible effects on, on Russia and Russia's policy. Is that the essence of it? Um, Creating Putin. Well, and see, this is uh, a much debated topic. Um, I am of the view that the Russians determine their own future. And that the argument that things that the US or Europe does uh, kind of leads to Russian behavior in some ways overstates our ability to influence what Russia will be. So I actually was of the view, and I supported, it was done uh, in the Clinton administration, but I was one of the early proponents of it, because I believe that we didn't want to leave a unstable middle ground in Eastern Europe. And again, am I, the, as the story I was trying to give you with German unification was, our strategy tried to include lessons from history. And one of the lessons of history was insecure Poland's, Hungary's, Czech, at that time Czechoslovakia and others, aren't good for the international order, whether they're worried about Germany or whether they're worried about Russia. Uh, or for that matter, uh, the Baltics also come into this piece. So I believe that um, having Poland in, uh, in NATO doesn't threaten Russia. I don't believe the Baltics threaten Russia. I don't think that the Russians should feel that this is their borderland and that they should dominate. Now, the question gets harder when you start to get to areas like Ukraine and Georgia. But here again, I would say the key question is, if we're willing to put a security guarantee forward, we have to mean it. So I personally would be willing to have US forces defend Poland, Eastern Europe, and others. I'm not sure the American public would do that for Ukraine. And so that's an area where I think I would come out in a, in a different position. But let me take your question 
and make one more uh, aspect about the legal work on this. Um, the last issue that uh, we had to resolve on the evening of September 11th, before the final settlement was signed, was the question of the status of non-German NATO forces in the former East Germany. So remember, we're returning the sovereignty of Germany fully, so it should make its decisions. We wanted Germany in NATO. For the first four years as the Soviets withdraw, there would be no non-German NATO forces. But what about afterwards? And this became an extremely contentious point. Um, and it also tells you a little bit about diplomacy. Um, the British raised the point as well as I did. And in the back of my mind was the thought that someday we may want and Poland may want to join NATO. And I didn't want to have a restriction on the ability of US forces to move across Eastern Germany to Poland. But I wasn't actually going to raise that on the table on September 11th. Um, so uh, we ended up resolving it with the core principle, which was to say this will be up to a sovereign Germany to decide. And you'll see a little footnote to that effect. The other part, from a diplomatic angle, was the, you'll see the German accounts are scathing about the British on this. And they didn't really believe that Britain was willing to give up Britain for German unification. Um, they don't criticize the Americans at all, even though I had the same position. But it reflects a little bit of the partnership we developed, which is by that point, we were so close together, they couldn't really bring themselves to criticize, even though we had a different position, which also tells you a little bit about kind of way alliances can work. One more. Yes, Renato. Well, that's a very fascinating question, and it, it really goes back to the strategy we were thinking about in 89, you see, because while we're, well, to me, what's interesting about this example, and I'm not arguing we got everything right, but this one did work pretty well. At the same time, we're dealing with an immediate issue in nine or 10 months. We were thinking ahead, and it was definitely my view that it would take a while, but a unified Germany would be the most powerful country in Europe. Not only did I want it embedded in NATO and the EU, but I wanted strong US relations with Germany. This was a little controversial at the time. You remember the Thatcher-Reagan relationship was very, very close. I was attacked in British newspapers. It didn't hurt that my name is from German descent, uh, as being you know, pro-German this and this, or whatever the term was. And I actually received some hate mail. It was a very, very, um, it's very sad. This, I remember this woman who'd lost, I think, her father in World War I and her husband in World War II. So the feelings that Thatcher was representing were deeply, deeply felt. Um, but strategically, we felt that Germany would be the most important country uh, in Europe, and we wanted to start out on the right foot. But that's relevant for today, you see, because one of the points that I've argued across the past 20 years is we started in a good relationship. We ought to keep that relationship. The way I describe it is Germany is the dominant power of Europe, but it doesn't want to be seen as dominating. And you can see that with Chancellor Merkel's approach. So look at the Euro crisis. Look who's determining the sort of issues. So how the United States works with Germany has been an important question today and will be very important in the future. Um, and I'm afraid we're not on the right track. I'd buy very strongly your far-sightedness. Not, not your farsightedness, but the notion that uh, being prepared for what was going to come, thinking about it in advance, and thinking in terms of perhaps decades instead of years is very important. Well, and this is where your question is quite important. Mm -hmm. In a way, you can say whether this worked or not. We wanted to avoid a Versailles victory. Okay, So we were trying hard not to plant the seeds of a future problem. And so I only touched on some of this, but what was done with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze and afterwards with the Russians, and I think the Clinton administration tried in its own way to do this, we were trying to avoid a breakdown, okay? The breakdown occurs uh, in any event, 
And then people will have to debate how much of that is due to Russia's characteristics and how much of it is due to kind of the relationship with the West. I continue to believe that uh, you know, if you have a more open uh, partnership with Russia, that uh, the countries of Western Europe are not going to threaten it. Its real dangers probably lie more to the east and to the south. But this is an issue where the Russians will decide kind of where they see their future position. And then he, by the way, it's worth I noting that, excuse me, uh, I'm a little bit worried about time. Here, make it. Yeah, well, see, I don't think there's a moral equivalence between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so I think our policy towards Mexico, which we could talk a little bit about, was uh, one of embracing uh, them through NAFTA. And indeed, this was the choice of the Mexicans. I don't think the Mexicans would have wanted to join the Warsaw Pact. So I live in a world where countries get to make their decisions, and we should help them if they want to cooperate with the United States. And there's a quality in the Russian diplomacy. And again, don't get me wrong on this. I'm a person who believes you have to take the world as it is. I co-chaired a summit with Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg on saving the 3,200 tigers left in the world. So I first met Putin when he was a young deputy to Sobchak, and I had conversations with him about a whole range of topics. I will say, he's a former KGB agent. And you better beware when you're dealing with former KGB efforts that he's playing you. Okay, it's a different, and you know, I've watched different presidents kind of mistake this. Um, so I think countries make their own decisions, and the role for the U.S. is to try to create an environment where people can move towards us in a systemic way. Sub point, we're not doing that today. I, th I think we better move on if we're going to get into the World Bank at all. Uh, the, I, do, I do hope you all agree after listening to Bob talk about remaking the Western world, that our students are all prepared to do that when they graduate from law school. <laughs> do, do we have any that are prepared for that? You were prepared for it somehow or other. All right, let's go on to the world, to the world, to the U.S. Trade Representative. Well, actually, it's interesting. For those of you that had the wonderful experience of listening to the justices last night, do you see how many of them wanted to be historians? So history is a good basis. So I'd suggest, and I've understood that now the law school curriculum has added some history and economics, so I think that's good. So um, U.S. Trade Representative. Bob's background is as a historian. Uh, multidisciplinary. So um, as Phil mentioned, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative is a little known, but actually one of the most intriguing jobs in government um, because it combines uh, diplomacy, negotiations, uh, foreign policy, with domestic and even local uh, interest in politics. Um, both Secretary of State's Powell and Clinton sort of said to me on the side, you know, we became Secretary of State and all the other foreign ministers wanted to talk to us about trade issues because for many countries, the international economic posture is their most uh, important one. But the other side of this is that, recall that the origin of USTR was that in the Kennedy administration, Congress created the special trade representative to take the negotiating power away from the State Department, where they would have been fearful that uh, the diplomats would give away American economic interests, and put it close to the president. And the current U.S. Trade Representative's office was created in 1974 in the executive office of the president. And Congress is basically saying, we want some politics to be part of the process. So it's a cabinet-level post, but it's not a cabinet department. This tension reflects the Constitution. The Constitution gives authority over trade, tariffs, to Congress. It gives authority over foreign policy to the President of the United States. So the U.S. Trade Representative works at the intersection. And it's quite a challenging uh, connection to make if you're not torn to pieces. <laughs> um, so the, the key point to remember here is that in early, for the first 140 years of the United States, Congress used this power over trade in individual bills to set individual tariffs. Uh, 
And the high point, or the low point, depending on how you view this, was the Tariff Act of 1930, the Smoot-Hawley Bill, uh, which set tariffs, individual tariffs, on over 20,000 items. Um, it, the average rate increase was 60%. It led to international retaliation. Uh, U.S. imports and exports declined by about two-thirds, along with monetary policy, seen as one of the contributors to the Great Depression. But for those of you that read the newspaper today and look at the importance of uh, people put on trade surpluses, uh, keep in mind, the U.S. had a trade surplus in the 1930s. It also had 25 percent unemployment. Four years later, uh, in the New Deal, um, there's something passed called the Reciprocal Trade Act of 1934. This was the delegation by Congress to the executive branch, Cordell Hall was the Secretary of State at that time, to make tariff cuts with other countries and to use the MFN principle. So the principle that if we give a tariff cut to country A and country B has uh, an MFN, then it also gets the cut. This has become so commonplace that in the Clinton era it was changed from MFN to normal trade relations because it became normal. And Cordell Hall goes out and negotiates uh, 32 of these agreements with 27 countries over the next 10 years um, and significantly reduced tariffs. But the reason this is important is this is the first delegation to the executive branch that continues in some form or another for 80 years uh, until today. And after World War II, the United States used this authority as part of the GATT round to lower tariffs first on manufacturing goods, then it's spent to agriculture, then services, intellectual property, rules for trade, dispute settlement, taking the whole notion of legal systems and seeing how we could expand them to the international trade environment. But of course, the US politics became harder as countries competed more. The United States had about 50% of the world's GDP in 1945. Today, it has about 17 or 18%. So by the time I became US trade representative in 2001, the Clinton administration, which had done good work in passing NAFTA after uh, President Bush negotiated it, they completed the Uruguay round, but they were running into uh, the storms of anti-globalization movement. Um, they were unable to get this negotiating authority that I mentioned um, uh, renewed. And some of you may recall in the late 90s, there was an effort to launch another global trade round in Seattle that sort of broke down uh, into riots. So as I came in, my number one plan was to regain momentum. And notice again some of the analogies here that I was talking about in German unification. One of the lessons I learned from Baker was success breeds success. You get wins on the board, and all of a sudden members of Congress want to support you, the business community wants to support you, other deport, the departments support you. So how do you try to sort of uh, create a sense of, of reversal and positive momentum? We were able to get the Trade Promotion Authority in 2001 and 2002 by two votes. Shows the importance of the President's leadership. President Bush is very committed to this. We were able to launch a global round called Doha in 2001. And uh, after one of the breakdowns, we actually got it back on track in 2004 before I uh, left to the uh, State Department. But I want to emphasize something that's in the news today. We also launched a push for free trade agreements. The United States' first free trade agreement was with Israel in 1985. Then we had NAFTA that was uh, passed in 93, went and effect in 94. Um, but I had an idea for a strategy which we call competitive liberalization. What I meant by that is I wanted to try to push the globe around. I wanted to try to do things regionally. But I also wanted to be able to act bilaterally so that if somebody stopped me in the, in the WTO, the GATT WTO system, uh, one country can stop 150 or now maybe 160. And I didn't want to be able to be paralyzed by one obstacle. So I was trying to move on multiple fronts. But also, I was viewing trade you know, as a larger U.S. role in the world. Of course, it's about economic efficiency and expanding markets. But properly seen, it can be used about development, rule of law, economic partnerships, even the basis for security relationships. Let me just give you some examples. We negotiated a free trade agreement with Singapore, normally a pretty free trading country. And I asked the minister, I said, look, I'm really glad you did this, but why did you do this? And he said, you know, we're looking ahead and we want to try to move up the value added chain. And we figure that the intellectual property rules and US free trade agreements will be the gold standard. And if we put those in a free trade agreement, it will draw investment in pharmaceutical industries. 
A few years later, I went back to the western part of Singapore and saw all these pharmaceutical, all these high sort of tech industries. El Salvador, a much poorer country where we negotiate with Central America. The finance minister said, you know, we got three administrations worth of reforms done in this agreement because trade is basically microeconomics. It's about opening markets. It's about sort of breaking down systems. Costa Rica had a monopoly in the telecom industry. It was very hard fought, but the people I was negotiating with knew that I was trying to help them as much as I was trying to do something for the U.S. given the size of the telecom market of Costa Rica. And in later years, the fact that they liberalized the telecom market meant that they could keep up with modernization, start to draw call centers, sort of change the system. Australia, uh, we negotiated a free trade agreement with Australia in part because Australia is an extraordinarily good security partner, but we wanted to keep the economic base. And it's been very important, again, in sort of the U.S. investment and business ties. Uh, Morocco, I launched a number of free trade agreements with Arab countries, thinking this would be important in openness. And I'll cite one particular example about this that wasn't a free trade form, but it's, it's, it's an interesting example. Um, Congress had authorized something called qualified investment zones, which were said for Arab countries, if Israel invested in the businesses, that they would employ the locals, but in textile apparel, they would remove all our barriers for those exports to the United States. Egypt and Israel had never been able to come to terms on this. I found at that time a reformist minister in Egypt uh, and a man, uh, Omer, who later became the prime minister of Israel. And we worked this out, and in 2004, we launched these qualified investment zones. And as I left, I was told there were two demonstrations in Egypt. One was about 500 people that was demonstrating doing anything with Israel. Because, by the way, this was the first agreement I learned between Israel and Egypt since the Carter era. First agreement. Um, and then there was another demonstration of thousands of people who wanted to be included in the zones. And I've checked, given all the turmoil in Egypt, what's happened to those zones. And those zones are still employing people, still keeping sort of Israeli investment. So it's an interesting example of how trade ties can support different types of security relationships. Um, the bilateral agreements can also become building blocks. So you're from Brazil. Yeah. Um, the United States tried to negotiate during my tenure a free trade agreement of the Americas at the same time we were doing bilaterals. I always knew it was going to be difficult because I, I think that the approach from Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela would probably not go as far as we needed to go. But the United States negotiated free trade agreements not only with Canada and Mexico, but with the five countries of Central America, Panama, Colombia, Peru, Chile, the Dominican Republic, about 50% of the non-US GDP. So you see, if I were in government today, and by the way, four of those countries, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, have formed something called the Pacific Alliance, sort of building on this further, I would be looking at what's happening in Brazil and how Brazil's politics are changing and how people recognize the closed economy created opportunities for corruption and oligopolies. And I'd say, is there a way we could actually reach out to Brazil? and help with Brazil's reforms, or Argentina. And there are voices in Brazil. Uh, former uh, Sarah, who was a former presidential candidate, makes these same points. But it's a point of how you can take the bilaterals and build something. So many of you would have heard of TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was with 11 other economies. That would have never been put together except for six of them. We already had free trade agreements. So it's an example of building blocks of rule of law systems uh, to drive this forward. There's a congressional strategy, too. Uh, that I emphasize. Obviously, Congress has authority. I tried to work with some of the leadership in Congress in part to move these free trade agreements forward so as not to make them so scary, to make them sort of regular product of Congress. And this is another interesting institutional idea. I had a very strong chairman of Ways and Means who didn't always get along with his counterparts on the other side of the aisle. But, but I uh, asked him, I said, look, can I try to create bipartisan caucuses? of a Republican Democrat that will support these agreements and see them from soup to nuts, see the country not just vote on it, but understand the negotiations. And he said, sure, that's a good idea. And some of the people who are leading trade today, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Kevin Brady, uh, Paul Ryan, they were the junior guys that were the co-chairs of these, and they're still proud of their work on these arrangements. So we were partly trying to plant uh, the seeds going forward. So kind of the bottom line is, just so you have a sense, the United States now has free trade agreements with 20 countries. Um, they represent about 10% of the world GDP. They represent 50% of our exports. Now, that's not a totally fair number because, for those of you who know trade, there's something called the gravity theory and you have sort of geography. 
But here's another interesting statistic. In the first five years after the U.S. does a free trade agreement, our exports go up three times faster than other exports. Now, what does this basically tell you? What it tells you is, to be honest, U.S. barriers are already here. Other countries' barriers are here. If we move down together to zero, we're going to do better. Now, I've spoken in terms of exports, but it's important to remember imports matter too. So keep in mind about 60% of U.S. imports are intermediate goods. They go into other products or they're capital goods. So you raise the cost of steel or something else, well, you're going to hurt your own sort of businesses. So I'll close with this point. This is an aspect of how trade in different forms can create a network of rules and systems and, frankly, perpetuate U.S. sort of policy preferences across services industries, IPR, anti uh, um, sort of corruption issues, transparency, but that's not the direction that we're going today. And I'm quite concerned that we could be deconstructing the system. Uh, <clears throat> questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in introduce yourself first, if you will. Uh, your name first. Uh, well, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, I don't think it is true. Um, look, there's a study, but one, uh, one part is people often just focus on exports. Um, the Peterson Institute of International Economics estimates that for an average household, they use three members of the family, that the various U.S. trade agreements have cut about $10,000 in costs, okay? So I don't know, go look out there and see how many foreign cars. Do people like foreign cars? When you go to the grocery store, would you like to buy food from other parts of the world at different times of year? Um, if, you're, uh, if you're, I mean, frankly, go look at the Trump people where they bought all their products for, for the stuff that they sold. So I happen to think that open markets add to economic efficiency, competitiveness. People who work in export industries earn on average about 18% higher than others because they're more productive workers who compete. Um, You'll notice the farmers are getting a little anxious about Trump's trade policy. It's because, um, you know, we export about one out of every three acres that is grown in America. Uh, so the beef, the cattlemen don't want to lose the beef market to Korea or others. And the key point to recognize is the world won't stop. So other people will go ahead with agreements and we'll just be left out. And again, p coming back on this international order point, what's particularly sad about TPP is that the way the U.S. negotiates agreements, um, we're kind of, because we're a cutting edge economy, we do cutting edge things. So we have special rules for e-commerce or sort of a digital economy, uh, other provisions. And um, uh, in East Asia, what the TPP would have done was made that the standard. And frankly, I think South Korea would have joined, you have others in Southeast Asia that joined. And then the question is, what pressure would that put on China? Do you want China to set the rules on some of these issues, or would you like us? And by the way, there are people in China that like the rules-based system, too. And that's part of their own internal sort of debate that they have to go forward with and grow. So what drives Trump's logic on trade uh, is bilateral trade deficits. So you'll hear what he focuses on and Wilbur Foss focuses on. We have like a $70 billion trade deficit with Mexico. And you'll have a hard time finding an economist that thinks that bilateral trade deficit should be a guide to policy. Um, although sometimes it's a hard thing to explain, so let me give you the best aspect I can. The U.S. has a surplus with Australia. Australia has a surplus with China. China has a surplus with the United States. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned comparative advantage. We've learned something about relative uh, growth rates. We've learned about sort of exchange rates. Or another way to explain it is, I have a bilateral trade deficit with my supermarket. But I don't go at night to stock shelves. I get money, I hope, some other location, and then pay it. That's at heart with a bilateral trade deficit. Now, I made an allusion with the Great Depression to your global surplus or deficit. But there again, I was trying to make the point, that should not be a guide to policy because look at the Great Depression. We had a surplus. Great, okay? What I look at is growth, productivity, employment, inflation. Those should be the goals that we're focusing on. But because Trump focuses on bilateral trade deficits, He's compelling his trade negotiators to try to move in two directions. One, with the NAFTA, what they're basically saying is, 
look, we want you to open markets further, by the way, using the TPP provisions that they damned elsewhere. But then they said, we don't want to be bound by any rules. Okay, and I, and I won't, I could give you the technical talk on this, but it deals with something called Chapter 19 and anti-dumping, it's a sunset clause, it's applying to safeguards, but there's five or six things. But what they amount to is basically saying, look, we want to be able to do what we want whenever we want. Notice, for law school, rules-based system? Mm, not quite. Um, and the question is, do you think the U.S. has benefited by a rules-based system? Because he looks at negotiations and transactions one by one and doesn't see the systemic issues. He has a different view on it. Now, the third thing that they're doing is that, in a sense, they're trying to go back to market share. They're trying to do what the Soviets tried to do with Eastern Europe under Comic-Con. They're trying to say, look, we just want to require that we reduce the deficit by, uh, that you have to buy so much of our goods or we'll make it somehow zero. Again, this is where economics should be taught at the law school. It just, it won't work, okay? So I actually feel that at the end of the day, there's about a 50% chance that Trump will pull out of uh, NAFTA or the Korea agreement. Um, I think uh, he's already said he wanted to, and the agricultural community went to the Secretary of Agriculture and said, wait, wait, wait. Um, but I think he may defer it because he knows that he'll get an uproar with Congress and it could hurt his tax bill. But having said this, what you need to do is discount what I say, because I'm using analytical models, and the key thing in understanding Trump is he doesn't work in analytical models. I mean, it's, I, I'm not trying to be negative about it, I'm just trying to be descriptive. He, he's, he's transactional, he's impulsive, he emphasizes uncertainty, um, he, he wants to try to use threats to destabilize, and he's willing to break things up and then hand it off. So look at what the process has been with things that he wasn't comfortable with, uh, whether Obamacare or not. He, he will say, I'm pulling it out and hand it to Congress. So I'm just telling you, analytically, I could see that under U.S. law, he has the authority to issue a notice of withdrawal to Congress that has 180 days. That looks like a tactic that he might very well use. So I hope I'm wrong, but I'm just giving you my best guess. One more. Yes, sir. That was for me, because I was the legal professor. You were the what? I, I was uh, legal. But that, it was for me or for Phil? For, for Hyman. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I oh, took your say mind. it again. <laughs> no. I can't? <laughs> In our country, we've got something called free speech. Well, first, in the transactional model, I think uh, it'll be important to watch what comes out of the President Trump's visit with President Xi in North Korea. I think he'll be looking for that. Uh, and I think that President Xi was quite shrewd, as was Prime Minister Abe, in trying to come early and develop a personal relationship. Going to your point, or your question, is, is that I think in this model, personal relations and even family relations matter a great deal. Um, but... <clears throat> You asked about the 301. The 301 is, which is for those of you that's under US trade law, it's uh, dealing with unfair trade practices and it creates an investigation, is focused uh, on the technology and intellectual property area. And I think there are serious problems there. Um, and the question then is, is it designed primarily to try to rectify the problems or as a rationale for building barriers? Um, We'll see, okay? But I, the way I would turn the question is as follows. China's been very forthright in identifying the sectors that it wants to advance to become a high-value added economy. It's in the five-year plan. It's in the China 25 man, 2025 manufacturing plan. They also identified tools. And some of the tools could be very good, better intellectual property rights protection, for example. Some of the tools could be very bad in terms of indigenous innovation. If I were USTR, and I did some of this 15 years ago, I'd be working with some of the Chinese authorities to say, look, if you use the indigenous innovation, you'll have some happy industries, 
but you'll lose contact with the other six billion people in the world, okay? And that isn't what Deng Xiaoping suggested. You'll lose them as markets and you'll lose them as innovation. So let's figure out a way where we can have win-win, which is a possibility in trade. I did notice that in President Xi's three and a half hour address, uh, that he mentioned the services industry, and that's a good example. So, uh, look, there are big problems, in my view, with some of the Chinese policies. But I found that you can find room with some of the Chinese officials who want to open up markets, not to please us, but to try to sort of create a better economy in China. And I think that will be one of the big issues for Liu He and others uh, in the next five years. Bob, the, uh, we have 15 or 17 more minutes. Do you want to move to sort of what's the direction the world is moving in, or do you want to do a little bit of World Bank first? Or if you don't know. Well, I'm let saying. me just combine them. Uh, I, what, I, what Phil and I had discussed is I was going to explain a little bit about where the World Bank fit into this. And let me just say this, is that remember, the World Bank was created in 1944 while World War II was going on, along with the IMF, uh, and the Marshall Plan follows because they're not as quick in getting off the mark. You have the GATT system to deal with trade, which becomes the WTO. And together, these become institutions that contribute to building an international economic order that was trying to avoid some of the problems perceived from the 20s and 30s, exchange rate policy trade policies, um, uh, movement of capital flows. Now, those institutions have had to evolve enormously. The IMF system was fixed exchange rates. We now have a flexible exchange rates. I was gonna talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of the World Bank, but let me just make this point. One of the problems with understanding the World Bank is that it's called bank. So most people think that it's about putting money out, because that's at least what banks used to do. Um, but in reality, the World Bank is about three different interconnected functions. One is, and it, it, it has different ways of deploying money, but its total amount each year might be 60 to $70 billion, which is not chump change, but in international capital markets, you know, modest numbers. So the key is selecting projects that will have multiplier effects or externalities that will help countries learn from the benefit of them and be able to expand it. Second, to try to use the knowledge and learning from those projects with other countries, and this is the wonderful thing about now the state of development, countries don't have to try to look at Western Europe or Japan and the US, they can look at other emerging market countries. So one of my favorite examples was Mexico started a program called Opportunatus, which was a conditional cash transfer program. And for about a half a percent of GDP, they gave money to the bottom 10 or 20 percent of households in Mexico if two conditions were met. Children had to go to school, people had to get health checkups. Probably did more for women's health in Mexico than anything in the history of the country. The World Bank worked to expand that to 45 other countries. And what was a good thing was, it wasn't then just giving textbooks or papers. We would connect them with the Mexicans to be able to sort of explain sort of what's going on. So the power of the World Bank used properly. Uh, we launched something about gender equality as smart economics. I found this quite fascinating because I, whatever country I went to, very different cultures, some of them not, you would expect, sympathetic to women's rights. If you say, look, if you exclude 50% of your population, what's it gonna do for you? You could get people on your side. And we learned in this Opportunatus program, in the Brazilian version, Bolsa Familia, um, we learned that if the money went to women head of households, it was spent more wisely. So you can analytically demonstrate these things. So whether it's those sort of issues, um, climate change, obviously a big topic. Um, we created a trust fund, Hank Paulson, at that time Secretary of Treasury and I, where we got uh, $7 billion of donations on top of our money, which we leveraged to about $50 billion, to experiment with different types of ways of helping developing countries uh, with climate change. So whether it's fragile and post-conflict states, whether it's the challenges of middle-income countries, uh, whether you know, it's uh, trying to help countries deal with social and education issues, the real power of the World Bank is kind of as a catalyst that does something innovative. And just, again, to give from, it's a sort of a legal point, there's a private sector arm of the World Bank called IFC. And uh, I was discovering that our return on equity from our investments uh, were about 22% in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so uh, we did something that I think, uh, Natalie may be able to confirm or not, 
is the only time it's been done, and I'm not even sure anybody's noticed it or reported on it. We created the first subsidiary of uh, multilateral. I created an asset management corporation in IFC to draw capital from, from sovereign funds and pension funds and others who wanted to learn more about these investments. So the ability to be creative and experiment and do good things, but also learn along the way, uh, is sort of enormous. Now, the last, coming back to the point that I think Phil was kind of uh, hoping to close in, was that what I've described to you with German unification and alliance was creating a foundation for the future. Uh, trade, I've tried to explain its connection with development and growth and kind of U.S. interests, our own sort of rule system. The World Bank is a financial sort of dimension of this. And so what I think is really at issue now is this system that the U.S. has created and modified over 70 or 80 years um, is now a question. So you hear about America first. Look, trust me, when I was representing the United States, if you got some foreigners in this, I took care of America's interests first. Okay, the question is, what's the way in which America is best served. Is America best served by having partners, by expanding a system, by trying to encourage more openness in markets, transparency, or is America best served by saying, each transaction on our own, and if we can screw you, we will, okay? So that's the real question that's now on the table. I don't think there'll be any comments on that. <laughs> any? Uh, th we wanted this to be part of the final discussion. I, uh, again, Bob has described a world created by the United States out of the aftermath of the Depression and the Second World War, created with our own interests very much in mind, but with a mind towards fairness too. He's described that, and he's, what he's telling us is that it's becoming uh, the object of attack by our own government. Now, there's nothing wrong with the government attacking something that's wrong, but Bob's case is that this was, that we've done very good things internationally with economics. Is that right? You got Stu Eisenstadt here, who did a version of what I did on the Republican side. Maybe we should get Stu to make a thought. That would be an excellent idea. Speak up, Stu. The difference is we really had a bipartisan agreement on the whole structure of how we relate to the world. Uh, what Carter did, the book I'm doing about the war, I just followed how Ray did. And there was a continuity. You could disagree with specific policy, specific policy, but you recognize that the U.S. was stronger by having alliances. We couldn't do things. So let me give you one other anecdote that may uh, show at least the debate. So earlier this year, I was in a small group with uh, Henry Kissinger, and Henry was saying, in my experience, he said, I expect presidents like to be successful and they'll move towards the mainstream. And uh, I said, Henry, it depends how you define success. And if you define success the way Henry or I would define it, that would be reasonable. We can watch and we can test empirically. I think that President Trump defines success as a political realignment that's focused on the forgotten man, 
and that at core, he will come back to demonstrating his, um, his commitment to issues on immigration or stopping integration, the wall with Mexico, and trade. And I think on security topics, he will be willing to uh, pound his enemy as appropriately, but I don't think, I think he'll be uncomfortable with the types of systemic challenges you would have in rebuilding something. Our, uh, um, uh, Afghanistan's a good example. He didn't want to stay in Afghanistan, but his generals convinced him that he would have a loss otherwise. I think in alliances, um, Trump is ambivalent about alliances. He thinks the United States has paid too much, we've sacrificed too much. Um, and, uh, but I think that he'll be held by some of the generals around him, particularly Mattis. So he'll throw rocks now and then, but I think the alliance system, I hope, will hold. I think the trading system, for the reasons we discussed, is much more at risk. Uh, Renato? Well, on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, let me introduce you to Natalie Lichtenstein, uh, who did the legal work for the Asian Infrastructure Bank after working with me at the World Bank, uh, where she was in the general counsel's office. But that tells you something. I, I, I think that the Obama administration made a mistake on the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. And that, again, I say this somewhat in jest, but there's a truthful point behind it. In most of my government career, I had countries coming around saying what they would like the U.S. to do and the U.S. to pay for. So frankly, if China came forward and said, look, we want to help capitalize an institution that will help fund international infrastructure, my response would have been to say, look, um, how are you going to do it in terms of uh, governance rules of anti-corruption, environmental policies, open procurement? And the man who chaired it, Jin Le Quinn, uh, who was Natalie's boss, partly hired Natalie, this is a pretty good system, to say, look, I'm going to get the best World Bank expert on this, and I'm going to try to figure out how to try to do it. And he, by the way, he hired a couple of other people from the World Bank. Um, so I think the United States made a mistake because I was associated with something 10 years ago about China becoming a responsible stakeholder. And doesn't mean I agree with all Chinese policies, but could we encourage China to support this international system? I didn't think this infrastructure bank undermined the system. If we were smart, we could use it to our advantage. Okay? Now, the practical reason was probably they didn't, the Obama administration didn't want to go to Congress to get money, and I can understand that. But this is a nice little connection to the World Bank. One of the other things I tried at the World Bank was to create a hub in Singapore to experiment with public-private partnerships and infrastructure. Because there's a lot of discussion on this, and the question is where would the public money come in most effectively? Mezzanine finance, equity, guarantees, so on and so forth. And um, I thought, under sort of Phil's method, you know, let's, let's learn from experience what works. And uh, I got actually uh, my friends in Singapore to put in $200 million. I got the IFC to put in $200 million. We created a billion dollar fund. Again, not big, but demonstrative. But what I would have done at the World Bank or the U.S. government, would I would have said, look, let's have the Asian Infrastructure Bank work with that sort of hub in Singapore. So it's an example of how you can use evolution in the current system and add on sort of other ones sort of going forward. Um, in terms of soft power, look, I used to, one of the few things he left off was I worked briefly at Goldman Sachs, you know, which came up with the BRICS idea. It was a marketing concept. I don't think that Brazil, Russia, and India, and China, but I now chair something called Alliance Bernstein, a big asset management firm. When we look at the world, I don't just look at Brazil, Russia, and India, and China as being part of one set. Okay? Um, but I think the, the larger point there, which is one I was going to make, but also is at risk, is um, how do the middle-income countries fit in the international system, you see? And this will, you'll see this is a big debate. Should the World Bank only help the poorest? or should it also work with the middle-income countries? If you take my approach, which is that the World Bank's work isn't so much about money, it's about knowledge and learning and rules development, 
you can do a lot with the middle income countries and then get the middle income countries to contribute to other countries. So I'm trying to build an international order not just of the wealthy and the poorest, but ones where the middle income countries have a place in the process. And this is one other factual point on this, which by the way is driving Chinese thinking. We did a, uh, when I was at the World Bank, we did a project with China called China 2030, which worked with the Chinese Development Research Council headed by uh, Liu He, who's now gonna be, I think, likely a vice, uh, minister, or vice uh, um, premier, driving reform. And we were partly trying to learn what were the lessons of the past that inhibited countries from going to middle income to high income. So we went back and looked in 2008 and we looked at the 101 economies that the World Bank had treated as middle income in 1960. And of those 101 economies, by 2008, almost 50 years later, only 13 had made it to high income, and one was Greece. So you decide whether to use 12 or 13. Um, but the Chinese were very aware of this. And so part of what we were working with them is what lessons had we learned about opening an international economy and system and productivity and other things to sort of move up to higher levels. On soft power, then the last point is, this is, in my view, what I'm a little worried about with the United States. People always didn't disagree with the US positions. We had lots of different conflicts. But I think underneath the surface, there was a recognition that the United States wasn't only in it for itself. The United States was trying to build something, and if it worked, it would help others. And uh, whether it's Bush's HIV AIDS program, or you know, whether it's these type of economic trade arrangements, I actually found that increased my leverage. I found that I would have more friends that would help me in the world on difficult issues if they knew I was representing the United States, but I was trying to help solve their problems too. I think it's a perfect place to stop, Bob. Uh, I wanna say before saying thank you to you <clears throat> that uh, we have just come in, uh, Richard Lazarus, who's responsible for putting all of this together. Uh, how many? How many panels today, Richard? Only 62, <laughs> and yesterday. And we have Mike Dukakis, who it's always a great pleasure to see. My classmate, among other things, from law school. And, uh, and Richie Lazarus is the reason I'm here, because I would never be invited back to the law school, given my sort of drift away. But we were classmates in section four? <clears throat> four. And I just want to say, uh, I. Uh, I think Bob Zellick was terrific. He, 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 I don't, uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think if I say anything further, I'll get so much applause. Good place thank to stop. you very much, everybody, and thank you, Bob, for really a very, very interesting presentation.